My guest today is Charlie Scharzer, who is Product Operations Lead at Palantir Technologies, where he created the operations function for the Gotham product organization. Previously, he worked in business development as a deployment strategist in Palantir's US government business, where he partnered with users, built product, and led client engagements. Before coming to Palantir, Charlie taught high school physics and chemistry in Newark, New Jersey. In this episode, we talk about the role of product operations and how Palantir saw the need to build this function. Charlie talks about the specificities involved with working with the government, as well as how to de-risk releases and make customers' lives easier when there's an upgrade. Welcome to Product Perspectives, the podcast for product people that gives a voice to their stakeholders. Hosted by Magali Pellissier. Each weekly episode shows you the other side of the product with interviews of the people who contribute to making products a success. They are engineers, writers, marketers, support analysts, UX designers, or even salespeople. Not only will they get the credit they deserve, but they will share their perspectives on what makes a good product and product manager. Stakeholder management is a key skill for product managers. So just as you're obsessed with listening to your customers, let's hear from your stakeholders. Welcome to Product Perspectives. I'm very happy to have you as a guest today. And you're calling me from the west coast of the US, is that right? Yes, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. Right. So I can see that early in your career, you were a teacher in physics and chemistry, and you were also a music director at some point. So talk me through your journey and how you ended up in product operations. Yeah, the music directing was in college. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I was, uh, I was split between uh, studying music, composition, physics. And then with my own story, I did a program called Teach for America, which places teachers, mostly college graduates, recent college graduates, in inner city schools or rural schools. And it was very interesting, very, very difficult. And if anybody knows a teacher is around a teacher, give them a hug. It's very important work. But yeah, Palantir approached me as just a, a cold offering. And they were looking for people with an engineering background who could explain things to people. And from there, I joined the uh, business development side of the organization. And I worked there for about five years one of my final projects was taking a large old legacy customer through a giant migration to essentially upgrade and move to a much more product supported or product led setup. Once that was completed, I was brought onto the product development side to essentially do that for the rest of the fleet. And this was the Gotham product. So largely serving our government customers. Doing a migration for the entire product exposed a lot of operational needs. And we built a team around it that I took on called Tech Execution, which is the essentially the equivalent of product operations, or at least as close as we, we get to it on the Palantir side. Right. Did you choose the name? Who came up with this name? It's the first time I hear it, Tech Execution. It was actually an existing name from an existing team that did analogous work on the Foundry more commercial at least at the time, focus side. Initially, it's like tech execution for our customers. So how is our fleet moving forward, healthy? And then it slowly migrated to tech execution on the development side as well. And eventually, as our team was Gotham Tech Execution, we just became known as GTX, which was the catch-all for the, the product operations team, at least in my mind. Working in product operations can mean different things, and it can have different names, as you've just pointed out with this example. What does it mean to be working in product operations at Palantir? What's the scope? How big is the team? How big is the product organization? Tell me a bit more about that. Yeah, so the product organization is on the order of hundreds of people at Palantir. My team uh, was always, give or take, within a couple people of 10. The initial focus, I think, coming from this like fleet migrations pattern was on upgrades and how do you manage this heterogeneous fleet because we work in very different environments. We may have customers in on-premise data centers, some may be on the cloud. There are various combinations. There are, there are classified clouds. 
and every customer may have a slightly different footprint. So how do we keep everything healthy? And then as we were able to systematize this a little bit more, we were able to focus more inward onto the product organization itself into something I think looks a little bit more like product operations. I didn't even know product ops existed or was really a thing even until I did some research and into the things that my team was doing. And I was very happy to learn that it was a, a real, real focus and a real, a real set of work that I could then, then build off of for myself and for my team. As far as I, I had a lot of leeway in terms of creating things, scoping the work. I treated it like a startup. So the scope initially was anything that would make our Gotham product organization go. So after a couple of years, this turned into delivery ops, non-functional requirements, roadmapping, change management, migrations, metrics, docs, and running our dog fooding and demo stacks. So the unifying vision was bringing some of the business development principles that I and other people on my team had developed working out in the field to the product org. And I think this was an extremely broad mandate that gave us a really wide impact. And I, I look back on all the projects we've done and there's just so many of them, but it also makes it harder for stakeholders for a, a larger, more established company to like really pin us down and know our area of responsibility. And actually to that end, we actually just broke the team up into its constituent parts earlier this month and merged functions in many ways with Foundry, which is our other product organization that services both government and commercial customers. So you've mentioned working on some exciting projects. Give me some examples of projects on which you've worked on. One of the more interesting pieces we got pulled into is how do we identify the right level of non-functional requirements for all the various places where we're working, where some may be more in an R&D capacity, some may be more focused on risk aversion or more established customers. And how do we know what development can go onto what, what stack, especially when the configuration of these stacks, they look a little different and the environment as well. So from the operational perspective, this turned into essentially brokering the list for what products need to do and when they need to do them at what point in their life cycle. And from there, being able to match that at a high level, at least with all the different environments we're in. So our, our customers and the teams that manage these customers understand uh, what can get on their stacks. And if they need something that's high priority, then we jump in and provide some operational support on the product side to make sure that our products meet the bar for the situations they're in. This took a lot of ramping up, talking to every single product team in an organization where there are hundreds of engineers and working hand in hand with leads on the business development side as well. Another one that we've been working on for a while is like, what is the, what's the shape of the fleet? Because much of this information is across an air gap. So it, we can't get it automatically sent to us like in a SaaS or a multi-tenant cloud environment. So step one was just take all data available, make it known, evangelize it throughout the product org and build a reference, which seems basic, but was really hard to do and hard to maintain when so many things have to be created manually. And then around two of it was working with our data engineers on all essentially to build more automated pipelines, basically every single thing we can possibly know that we are sending to our customers and then build that into uh, into a resource that was really well received. And it seems like knowing the state of the world is basic, but I think in an environment where you do work with classified customers, it's a huge value add to just know what you know. And there's there's a corollary here, corollary here, which is like, know what you don't know. And you touched on this several times saying that your customer is basically the government. So what kind of challenges does such a product bring? Which difference does it make to work for a government product? So I think working with government organizations hits a couple of different things that you may not get with other types of enterprises, although you definitely can. Things like the security and the classified environments and customers that are a little bit more risk averse. So I, so I guess one thing that I haven't touched on yet is like, how do you handle change management at these types of organizations? which takes us back to like the upgrades and, and the delivery process, which was really the root of, of our team. Some of the things that have worked well or like advice for, for how to make this safer is to avoid overloading change. So I think from the recipient's perspective, it's really easy to see a bunch of related events or related technical changes 
and associate them all as the same thing and then think, wow, there's this big event, something crazy is happening or a lot is happening. We need to push the brakes or at least slow them down or add more UAT or a process around it. But you can do things like deconflicting upgrades and mandatory feature rollouts for some of these customers. Like an example would be you upgrade and then you have the ability to turn on a new feature and test it out if you need to. But then it becomes required before you go to the next version. With different enterprises also, I've seen customers trying to roll out a lot of things at the same time in various programs, us included, which just, can, yeah, it conflates the amount of change happening. Another thing that goes really, really far is documentation, especially with user empathy for IT in, with some of these organizations. Even if they aren't implementing the change, they should have access to the means to understand it. And then on the technical side, there are ways of specifically de-risking these types of upgrades like clustering so you can upgrade without downtime, doing something like blue-green, but you have to walk the customers there so they understand where, where the value is. And it's worth flagging that I wouldn't call all of our customers risk-averse, and then, but many are and many are different. And risk-averse also means different things to, to different people. And another thing too, is just like catering to this risk aversion actually has a huge risk to the day-to-day -day life of a product organization. And it's really easy to bias towards that. And it's always something to keep in the back of our mind. Like, are we biasing towards pushing forward? Are we being held back by some of these institutional thoughts that like previous eras that people may have had for how do we reduce risk? I think what you're mentioning right now is what I would do as a product manager, because even if it's not the government, when I think of um, right now, some of my customers are big financial institutions, huge organizations. So obviously they don't want a release to go wrong. So there's a lot of these learnings that you can apply to enterprise customers in general. And even if it was a startup customer using your product, I don't think they want their platform being down for a few days. So it's definitely you know, some best practices that you can implement. And you're right, but there's a balance between what we want to do to protect the customers mm -hmm. and also not blocking the release of, of products. So my question would be, does this impact your ability to be agile, to release frequently, to use some validation techniques like A-B testing, the fact that you, you want to protect those customers? Yeah, and we release with Apollo, which is our own delivery platform that does enable different types of customers to release at different frequencies, whatever is most suitable for them. I think the more we can take upstream, the better in terms of like front end testing with quality engineers, releasing frequently like with customers where we can release early, like we do have all of that. And there are many places where, in fact, most at this point where we're able to implement this effectively for the places where the, the change, the change management is highest. I think it does like really come down to building trust with uh, individual customers and making sure that they understand what they're getting and why they're getting it and all the things that go into it. And then holding up our end of the bargain by protecting them uh, as much as possible and being straight with them about like, here's the change that's happening and not letting other things get in the way of it. Right. And let's assume that despite all those precautions, something goes wrong, you have to maybe roll back a release because it's causing an issue with a particular customer. Has this ever happened? And what did you do internally? That's a good question. We have a development team that thinks about things like this from the technical side a little bit more. But from the operations perspective, especially when you're in a microservices world, I think this only works when you're coordinating data rather than coordinating people. Because you can see with different product owners, if, every, if everyone on the dependency tree has to do something, then it's a huge effort. But if you're able to roll back in bulk, so to speak, or able, to, able for one person to be empowered to get our product into a good state, then... I think it's a lot more scalable. So we researched on a project on our team essentially to make it, to gather the data together and make it really easy for a single operator to understand here are all the things we would need to roll back. And again, a lot of this is enabled by our Apollo infrastructure. Yeah, and that leads us to a word you've repeated several times, which is data and behind that, which metrics you're measuring. 
So what does good look like? Which measures do you track? Yeah, quality is a very broad term. And at least the area I'll approach isn't necessarily like something that our quality engineers would work on. I think they would be much more credible in their opinions there. But one thing I can touch on again is our, our product or our effort around some of these non-functional requirements where we actually tried to essentially like provide a product census for, uh, again, like all available information about our different product suites, what they do, anything, anything we knew about them, but it wasn't all that actionable. And I think the, the key, at least in my end, was not just providing the data, but also enabling the means to do something about this. So what we ended up doing is uh, once we had the list of, of requirements that the different dev teams or that our products needed to meet, we built all of them into several data pipelines that we called deployability readiness and put it into a workflow where this data was directly feeding decisions about what products can be installed or used by various customers, depending on their lifecycle stage. And it made it really easy to find gaps and realize like, hey, to go here, we need to have, have this met. It made the data the gatekeeper. And we were only really pulled in on like the operational support side when something was really urgent and we needed to, to smooth things out. And, and, and again, like, have, I mean, we're Palantir, we have access to Foundry, which is our big commercial and government now product that makes it really easy to go from a data integration layer to an operational decision-making layer. That was my takeaway from data is like, how do we build something to enable something to be done? And how do we not just like provide the data, but build a related workflow? Great. Uh, thank you. So you mentioned your company, Panantir, and there's Peter, who is one of the product management leads at Panantir, who has a question for you. Given that most issues with products happen at the seams between existing teams and different areas of ownership of a single PM, how do you want to collaborate with PMs to talk about cross-functional issues across a larger product suite? One of the best pieces of advice given to me is when you want to do anything, just start with the goals. And when working with product managers, you have to identify the target workflow, kind of ground that in the, the mission benefit, and then assume that I'm the only one who might have all of this in my head and not just knowing everybody else is going to be able to see it or see how, like directly how their products are going to relate to some of the others. So then more tactically, this looks like identifying the universe of knowns up front and making sure that everyone understands how their part relates to the others. And then like a couple of things that could be fail modes or some stuff that I've done in the past is that you have to fight the tendency to treat progress as linear. It's easy to like be blocked on one thing and then get through that and then be blocked on another thing or another team and then keep moving. So again, this just goes back to identifying upfront all the areas of the product that, that could be affected. And then also something that could be hard, conceptual or maybe even like more semantic differences where the assumptions between two teams may be different and those decisions can be legacy decisions and identifying that and navigating that might be the hardest part out of a lot of this. So it looks to me like in your role you do a lot of you know, stakeholder management and you have to be very good at communicating, explaining things and getting people together. So do you think that your experience in business development prior to this role has helped you be better in your job now as a product operations person? Yes and no. So I think my experience in business development involved a little bit of everything, account management and working with users. And I think doing so much, I have it, my own tendency is to want to spread out and world build. And I think that this is... Like the thing that I wish I could have done more with this and that I plan to do more in the future is more proactive engagement, especially with prioritization. So that, that's my biggest recommendation in learning is being able to say up front with the various stakeholders for my own team, here's everything we're doing and can like, do we need to stack rank it or is there any flags? We've done this to some extent, but I, I could have done more. And then the other piece of it for any tactical situation, for any like comms that I review or try to get together is just identifying what are the incentives 
for for various counterparties, being able to understand the motivations and what everybody else wants to do, and then like make the communications in terms of those motivations. Great. And that makes a nice transition into the final part of this interview, which is fire questions. So product operations or business development? Well, in some ways, product operations is just business development, but internally focused. And then there's another part of it about it here where like, you can see we're a team that tries to build and we want to do something that lasts and becomes self-supporting rather than just be operational support. And that's something that you see in various places, whether even like more so in, in product development. So maybe that is like why in some ways we had such a broad mandate is that we took principles from from everywhere. Government or startup? Man, pinning pinning us down is is tricky. I would just I would go with mission for a third answer. We're that like that's the North Star is enabling our users. High risk or low risk? Turning high risk into low risk. So I guess low risk. I love the answer. Yeah, perfect. There's always an amount of risk, but the more you can do to minimize it, so very good answer. Mm -hmm. Going back to your background, physics or chemistry? Physics. Yeah, I was put to teach chemistry because there are only 20 kids in the physics class. Right. And we almost recorded this interview in London when you came to visit. So San Francisco or London? I'm a native Californian, so I'm always going to go with uh, the West Coast. All right. That's it. That's the end of the interview. No, I'm, <laughs> no, I'm <laughs> joking. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate. I think the, the takeaway is what product operations means depending on the organization and what the impact can be, what your role is about, but also what I can do as a product manager, you know, from a British perspective to help you and mm -hmm. uh, our customers when there are high risk releases to transform them into low risk. So thank you very much. That's been quite useful. If people want to carry on the conversation with you, can they reach out to you on social media or any other way? Yeah, for sure. Probably LinkedIn. Great. Perfect. Thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to this podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and colleagues and rate it on your favorite podcast platform. If you have suggestions for topics and guests or any feedback, you can write to Magali Pellissier at hotmail.fr.